Hi everyone, my name is Thomas Munro. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, Postgres 11, which came out today um, in a wonderful coincidence. About came out about four hours ago. There was a like I saw the tag and Git Git repo, whatever. Um, so that'll be in you know dot deb files and whatever in, in the next 24 hours or whatever it is. Um, so before I give the talk, um, I just want to say I, I gave this talk um, I, at a conference in the States. I, I was uh, um, very happy to be invited to go and speak at a conference in San Francisco. I hadn't been there before. It's a, it's a really cool place. And um, the <coughs> talk is sort of, a, was sort of done for a Postgres audience. So before I sort of give the talk, I just wanted to check how many of you use Postgres or have you used it? Everybody, basically. So that's good. I'm, I'm in the right place. Okay. <laughs> um, has anyone used the parallelism features in Postgres yet? No. Okay. So I'm still in the right place. Good. Um, so, and, and how many of you would be able to read the output of explain and would use explain? Has some idea what, what the, the concept of, you, you've seen the word explain before? Okay. Cool. That's good. I could do that. <laughs> um, good, okay. So just a couple of words about myself. I am a Postgres hacker. I've been working full-time on Postgres for about three and a half years now. Um, before that, I did evil proprietary software for uh, 20 years or something. And um, uh, since this is like, I, by the way, I, I think WASAD is a really cool uh, set up and I want to say thanks to Grant for setting it up. It's a, it's a really good format because we have all kinds of different open source projects, people talking about different subjects that they're really interested in, so that's great. And we didn't quite seem to have the critical mass for a Postgres meetup. Um, and so it's nice to, you know, be able to put together something that's got all kinds of different interest groups and, and you know, um, it, it's, a, it's a great solution to that, to that problem that other groups can't quite get the critical mass. And um, yeah, it's really interesting to, to see a wide range of topics, so thanks for setting that up. Um, but in, because of WASAT's wider thing, I just wanted to say that um, I'm also really interested in FreeBSD, um, and uh, so one of my um, things that I'm interested in is trying to make that combination work really well, like sort of hacking on operating system stuff and um, uh, database stuff so that the combination works well. Um, but this is all things that I've been doing quite recently um, since leaving working on proprietary software, and it's um, it's going pretty well. I'm really enjoying it. Um, yeah, so I work for this company called Enterprise DB, and um, th we, um, that's a, a company based in the States, and it has made a huge investment, along with a couple of, there's a handful of companies that develop Postgres, or pay Postgres hackers to work full time on it. And um, the project of getting Postgres to execute parallel queries has been going on for about four years now. Um, and I kind of came in, managed. I, I, I moved back to New Zealand from overseas um, at that time, and I managed to convince them to let me work from home from an uh, island in the South Pacific. And uh, <coughs> so, yeah, I, I'm, I guess I'm pretty new to actually working on open source as a job. Um, and yeah, this is a bit of background about me. Okay, so these are the f parallel features that came into Postgres over the past few years. We have one uh, major release every year. It comes out this time of year, it came out today, as I just said. Um, so if you go back to 2014, 2015, Postgres 9.4 and 9.5 came out and they had some infrastructure hidden inside them that if you were writing extensions in C, you could get at those, but like there were no real user exposed features. Um, that was preparation. 9.6 was the first release that had user facing features that could do parallelism, um, but it was not enabled. So we didn't really want to break everyone's query or change everyone's queries like that sort of overnight. We wanted to sort of ease people into it because it was a big, big change, you know, to the way the database works. Postgres 10 2017, around about now, this time last year, was the first version that had parallelism enabled by default. Anyone here using Postgres 10? Okay. So maybe you've seen a bit of parallelism. Um, if you're lucky or unlucky, I don't know. How would you tell? Uh, Aside from it being faster, like in, in things like this. In the expand plan, you would see um, a gather node somewhere, um, and it would, t it would say the word workers, like two workers, three workers, something like that. Um, usually that would happen with queries that touch a lot of data. If you're doing OLTP stuff, like updating single records at a, at a time, that would never happen. But if you were scanning millions of rows and summing stuff and so on, then you'd start to see parallelism. All of my really interesting products are still on older Postgres. 
that's all my, all my newer simple toys are, are in the latest stuff. That's probably the way it should be, right? <laughs> you don't, you'd... If you run top, you'll see a query running on there. Not all the prices, right? Yeah, yeah. I'll show you some top output in a minute. So yeah, cool. So this year and today, in fact, Postgres 11 came out, and this is where we we start to get. Um, parallel joins and some more advanced things. A very simple thing that we got today is parallel create index. Everybody will notice that hopefully when they start using Postgres 11 that create index will be two to three times faster just because it's using more CPU cores. So that's like, those are the features I'm gonna talk about but I'm gonna go into some detail about those. Um, so historical context, um, I used to go to C++ conferences and um, I saw this very slide like loads of times because around that time about 2000, yeah, 15 years ago, or whatever, 13 years ago, whatever. Around 2004, um, Herb Sutter, who's a C++ guru at Microsoft um, now, back in 2004, he wrote a, an article that was quite influential called The Free Lunch Is Over in Dr. Dobbs' journal, I think it was, which is a defunct C++ journal. Um, and <clears throat> that was the point in time, 2004, where there was this inflection point where CPUs stopped getting faster. Well, they were still getting faster, but they began to plateau. It's, plateau. it's quite visible there. Um, and that's also the same point where they started getting more than one core. It had been one core per chip for a very long time. Um, and now the core counts are obviously rising pretty quickly. So that was a really big deal because we had to figure out, like, your stuff stopped getting faster um, at that point, more or less, um, unless you changed your programs. And writing programs that use more than one core is easy in some cases and very hard in general. Um, so, like, it's like, a, I like to use the example of painting a house. If you're painting a house and you add one more person, you can just paint different bits of the house at the same time and that's embarrassingly parallel, parallel as they say, or parallel light, that word's so hard, parallelizable. Um, but in general, something like taking any one SQL query they wrote and parallelizing that is actually really quite difficult. Um, and we'll talk about why. So looking at that timeline of what happened to CPUs and how they stopped getting faster, um, I also want to talk about how, how um, multi-core computers are, are, are or multi-core chips are a new a newish thing, but actually multi-processing in general is not that new. I mean, if you go back to the 1960s, like a really long time ago, um, 1960s, 1970s, that you had Burroughs and, and IBM mainframes uh, that cost millions of dollars, but they had multiple CPUs. Uh, they were asymmetric multi-processing, so they had like maybe the operating system kernel was running on only one chip or CPU, whatever, whatever form the CPUs took in, the, in, in those days. And the, the other ones were slightly more specialized, but it was still multi-processing of some kind. And then there were, then there were um, specialized systems like Cray supercomputers and so on. But these things were all, excuse me, way outside the reach of, say, normal com companies and certainly outside the reach of normal people. Um, but in the 1980s, things started to move really quickly. There were some machines that cost, um, these are in American dollars, you know, these kind of $400,000 machines from, from, from VAX that had two CPUs. Um, but in the um, mid to late 80s, there were some really interesting companies that um, were startup companies that started doing interesting things like um, Sequent is one particular company that I'm interested in. They built these machines. It was created by some guys who left Intel and stuffed like 30 486 chips into a machine, into a fridge basically, and figured out how to, how to, and it, that wasn't easy because, uh, you know, those chips weren't designed to share memory and coordinate the access to, to devices or memory and so on. Um, they weren't intended for that purpose in the way that modern chips are. So that was hard work for these guys to do that stuff. But these computers were still outside the reach of normal companies, I would say, or people. And they could be up to half a million dollars. But universities got them and researchers got them and they started figuring out some stuff to do with databases on them because databases are one of the, one of the major you know, usages of computers. Um, the things really started to change with the dot-com boom sort of time. Um, in the early 90s, uh, which is when I first started to see computers uh, personally, um, the big iron Unix systems like uh, Sun and SGI and all these guys started producing machines that were only 20 grand, that had um, a couple of CPUs, um, and then the count of CPUs started, started growing. But these are separate CPUs, not separate cores on, on one chip, but separate sockets, you know. Um, but things really kicked off in the mid to late 90s when People like Dell started mass producing these. Um, well, first of all, Intel started producing Pentium chips that were designed to run together with in, in quad or dual configurations, and they had the right kind of memory hardware to deal with that kind of you know, design. <coughs> and you started seeing, this is when I started working, uh, came out of university and started working, and you know, companies were filling up racks with these 10 grand servers that had um, quad. Uh, yeah, and around that time, we started seeing um, 
Linux and other operating systems, FreeBSD and so on, started supporting multiple CPUs. And then think, you know, we haven't looked back from there, there really. Um, but we're still trying to figure out how to program them, which is the interesting thing. I mean, essentially, uni processor systems and operating systems are now completely extinct. Um, and your, your watch probably has multiple cores, right? Um, so how does that relate to relational databases? Well, um, this is an interesting archaeological uh, discovery I made when digging through ancient Postgres source, uh, source control systems. So Postgres began as a research project at, at Berkeley, um, UCLA, UCLA Berkeley, um, and they it lived for a certain period of time. It, um, I think it had um, you know a certain amount of funding that f I don't know why it exactly it ended, <coughs> but there was this um, the, an end to Berkeley Postgres. And then there was the open source Postgres project that we use today, which begins with a commit that happened in 1996. During that black time, there's no um, source repo where we can see what happened. But in that time, it lost parallelism and gained SQL. It used to use Quell, a different, a different query language. Um, I think that's really interesting. I'd love to track that down, that source control history, and sort of see how exactly that happened. But I think what probably happened is that during this time, the Berkeley guys had got their hands on one of those sequent computers, which is, looks like a gigantic fridge full of CPUs, and figured out how to do parallel query stuff. Um, by the time it became the open source project, well, no one had access to that kind of hardware, and they were trying to develop stuff on a 386 or whatever. I don't know what kind of computers they had, maybe a small sunbox or something like that. Um, so they couldn't really maintain it. Meanwhile, all of the um, big commercial database systems, uh, beginning with Oracle, all the big names um, started doing parallel query uh, throughout the 90s as people gained access to the big, big iron uh, systems. And then here we are right at the end here, just three years ago, coming out with Postgres 9.6, which was able to do parallelism again. So we kind of won and lost the race uh, at the um, same time. Missing from that list is MariaDB or MySQL. Where, where does it sit? Uh, I don't know very much about where they are. I don't think they have parallel query at all right now. Okay. Um, they. Um, there's a lot of stuff you can do with a database without having parallel query because, um, as we were just saying before the talk started, if you're just doing OLTP work, then you have no use for parallel query. Like, you want to run 300 sessions at the same time, they're all going to be using, you know, you're going to be able to spread your workload around, and they're each doing a tiny amount of work. There's no real, like, the cost of coordinating that, any kind of parallelism would, would dwarf the, the, the gain. So it's really only worth doing when you're doing bigger queries. People will, they will eventually figure, MySQL will, will eventually be on this chart, I'm sure, or one of the one of the forks. I don't know. Sorry. I don't know. That's a good question. I don't know very much about MySQL, so I can't really say. But um, yes, I do know that we have uh, thoroughly beaten them on that front. Uh, so <laughs> but I'm sure, they'll, I'm sure they'll, they won't be too far away. Um, OK, so um, there's one kind of database that I think is a really interesting piece of history. Um, Tandem nonstop SQL actually beat all of those systems, and it was used to run a whole bunch of stock exchanges and banks and stuff like that in the 70s and 80s. Um, at some point, it became a SQL database. Before that, it must have been some other query language. It was scalable and beat everybody, and that company was, it was a really cool piece of technology, which was then, I think, bought by, was it HP? I can't remember. One of those companies. And um, <coughs> There's some great anecdotes about how the London Stock Exchange used to run on one of these, and then um, I probably shouldn't say this is being recorded, but uh, uh, there was a huge catastrophic failure when they tried to switch over to a Microsoft-based stack, and then loads of people got fired, and they did a completely they had to start again. Basically, it was a it was uh, it's quite an interesting case to read about uh, a piece of 1970s technology that was doing a really good job, a piece of. Uh, technology from our age just could not keep up with it and failed completely. I thought that was really interesting um, as an um, amateur archaeologist of computer systems, if you, if you want. Um, but the reason I'm not talking about that and the, the, the distinction I'm trying to make here when I compare that system with um, parallel Postgres is shared memory and shared storage systems um, that have basically one computer with many, many cores or many CPUs and shared memory. Um, are quite different from big clusters of many computers talking over, over a, uh, a network. The problems of parallel query planning are similar in some ways, but the economics are very different. So the, 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 the way that there's a, there's a lot of overlap, but there's also a lot of different things. But these sub subjects aren't actually separable because, well, they're not completely separable because all of the, the so-called MPP systems, massive parallel processing database systems, the individual nodes of those systems are shared memory systems. So they have kind of both kinds of parallelism in their query planning. I'm only going to be talking about 
par parallelism within one computer with a shared memory and you know many CPUs or and, and shared storage. Um, because I well, first I don't know too much about the, the the bigger problem of distributed query planning, and secondly, it's like a huge topic. So um, uh, <coughs> right, so the example I'm going to start with is vote counting. This is probably not how they really count votes. I'm just making this up. But imagine that you're <laughs> running an election and you want to count the votes, and you have all these people who are vote counters, scrutineers they're called, um, and you've got ballot boxes that are full of ballots, votes. Um, so this is kind of embarrassingly parallelizable, right? Because all you have to do is get each person just has to grab a box of votes and count them, uh, and then keep doing that until there are no more boxes. And then at the end of that, someone, let's call them the chief scrutineer, I don't know what they really call it, I just made that up, but uh, waits till, until everyone finishes doing that and then adds up all the subtotals, and then you've got the answer. Now, if you think about this, I mean, if you want this to go twice as fast, you can have twice as many people and you might get some kind of linear scaling. At some point, you can't fit any more, you know, you run into physical constraints, you can't fit any more people in the room, or they start crashing into each other when they're trying to access the boxes or something like that. But I mean, forgetting about practical details like that, this is essentially li linearly scalable by adding more people, right? That's what, that's, that's what we want to achieve. We want to break all problems down to some kind of really simple thing like that. So if we imagine exactly the same scenario in a database table called votes, and where um, I use Democrats, I gave this talk in the States, so um, we, you're counting, um, select count style from votes where party equals something. In Postgres uh, before, uh, in older versions of Postgres or in current Postgres, if you set max parallel workers per gala to zero, you'll get a query plan like this. A sequential scan over the votes table, filtering by something, and then an aggregate, which, um, you know, uh, so the sequential scan spits out whatever, five million rows, whatever that is, the aggregate counts them up and spits out one row. And that's your answer. And that query took, let's call that about three seconds. If you use max parallel workers per gather equals two, um, completely contrived queries, of course, running on my laptop. So um, you, this query runs, first of all, we notice that it runs in about one second. We notice that it talks about launching two workers. Um, it went about three times faster, two workers plus the original back end that you're talking to when you're, you, you sort of add one because that's the way we do counting processes. Um, so looking at the query plan, you can see there's a couple of extra nodes that have popped in here, but you've got the same basic structure. You've got, instead of saying sequential scan on votes, you've now got parallel sequential scan on votes. You've got this new funny thing in the middle here called gather, which is talking about workers. And then you've got this aggregate. Um, you've got this partial, the, the aggregate node has been split into two. You've got this partial aggregate here and this finalized aggregate here. This is like the, 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 the three workers here, the, the two workers plus the leader process, are like the scrutineers counting, counting votes and the chief scrutineers waiting for them to finish and then adds up the, the right. So we've sort of, this query plan does the very simple stupid thing that I described on the previous slide. It's faster, which is what, what we wanted to achieve. It's not quite three times faster and that's because of real world facts like um, that are, comparable to people bumping into each other when they're going to get the boxes, right? Because they're all trying to use the same disk head and so on, and you know, you, you run into various problems, uh, forms of contention. I'm gonna skip right over that problem though, and show how that query plan, another way of looking at that query plan in a more graphical form that's a bit easier to understand, you can see that there's some scattering and some gathering going on. You're scattering the data across, so um, these are the query plan nodes, just this middle piece here. That's the leader process, it's running that query plan, which is kind of linear, it doesn't have any branching in it, so it can be shown as a line. And then we have these two worker processes that are running a copy of the part that's below the gather node. So the three CPU cores are all doing the same thing. They're all doing this in, in, in common. But these three, they're copies, running their own copies of these executor nodes. But this one here, they're kind of, this parallel aware node, they're kind of linked together. They're like coordinating their activities. And the thing that they're doing when they're coordinating their activities is giving out different disk blocks to each other. Okay, so how does that actually work? Well, I'm gonna start by talking about operating system concepts like processes and memory and I.O. and stuff, and then I'm gonna talk about the, the database executor, and then I'm gonna talk about the planner and, and how you might tweak it. Um, okay, so first of all, when you're running post Postgres in general, you'll see that there is a process for every connection. 
which is pretty old school Unix design, right? I mean, that's like that's how software was, and then like literally in the 1970s, that's how Unix software looked. And there's a quote here which I <laughs> put out in full here. I don't know if I should read it out from a 1989 paper from Michael Stonebreaker, who was the creator of the Postgres project back in the 80s. He said. Currently, Postgres runs as one process for each active user. This was done as an expedient to get a system as operational as quickly as possible. We plan on converting Postgres to use lightweight processes. That's what they used to call threads in those days. Available in the operating system we're using, including Presto for the sequence symmetry. That's that big fridge of CPUs I talked about. And threads in Sun, SunOS. Um, so 30 years ago, they were planning to, to switch to threads. And I'm sorry to say we have not yet managed to pull that off. <laughs> And in fact, the longer we leave it, the more difficult it gets <laughs> as people build more and more stuff around the multi-process design. But um, on the other hand, there's a bit of a swing back to multi-process designs, particularly in the browser world. Um, so maybe if we wait long enough, we'll actually be cool again. I don't know. <laughs> um, so I'm sorry to report that with parallel uh, query execution, we keep the same design. And here's a quote from me right now. <laughs> um, we use one process per parallel worker uh, as an expedient to get a system is blah, 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 you get the, the joke. So um, yeah, these processes look just like any other backend, except that they have this funny name telling you that they're a, a worker for that other, that number there matches that number there. So these two processes here uh, um, belong to that one. And we start up and shut down processes for this, um, for each parallel query you run, which might sound a bit inefficient. You might want to have a pool of them. I mean, there's all kinds of things that we're probably going to be getting around to doing. And, as we refine the thing, but <coughs> excuse me, this gets us off the ground. And in general, parallel <coughs> queries, for all kinds of reasons, are not worth doing unless your query is going to take at least, well, at the very least, tens or hundreds of milliseconds, probably seconds or hours, big queries, you know, that's where you want to get some. So you don't really care about the cost of forking. That's the theory at the moment. Of course, eventually we'll stop using that excuse and start doing something slightly better than that, but um, yeah. So next topic, uh, shared memory. Um, traditionally, Postgres, like um, many uh, traditional fork-based systems from that era, we have this big piece of shared memory that we create. And then each process that is forked um, inherits the, the memory map from its, from its parent. And so we all have access to this piece of shared memory. And that's got the buffer pool in it. Um, these are regular backends. I put alpha leader on there. and. Um, when a, a parallel query is run, we, we needed more shared memory than that. So we create these throwaway mappings, extra bits of shared memory, and the work is attached to that. And then, so for, for one parallel query that's running with two, two workers, it's got this extra piece of shared memory. It can pump tuples through there and do various kinds of coordination through this extra shared memory. So you can see that if you look at the process map, or PMAP or whatever, of any of these processes running. You can see all these mappings appearing and disappearing. Um, we needed to invent some other kinds of IPC or inter-process communication. We needed to invent um, uh, new kinds of condition variables and barriers and, and various bits and pieces like that, which may sound strange if you're used to application programming. Like, why would you make your own condition variables? That sounds crazy. But um, the database people, first of all, they always make their own everything. And secondly, um, there's a good reason for it. <laughs> um, and that's that um, it's tightly connected with the monitoring of the system. And you can sort of see what's waiting on what. And, and you know, if you try and use something for out of libc or whatever to do that kind of stuff, you won't get that kind of introspection that we, that we want. And we have much finer control of the behavior. And uh, we also get the same characteristics across different um, operating systems and so on, which is something we care about. OK, uh, and tuple queues is a big thing. Um, the ability to uh, funnel tuples through to other processes was something that we obviously needed to do. OK, so moving on to the um, executor, or executor, as some people say. I never remember to say it that way, even though it sounds better. But, um, so <clears throat> when looking at an explain plan, you see uh, executor nodes. They have names like sequential scan, or index scan, or hash join. Um, and uh, we introduced this parallel prefix, which tells you that that executor node is doing something special. <clears throat> so when you're looking at a query plan, you can see um, some parallel oblivious executor nodes, which are doing what Postgres has always done. They don't know whether they're in a parallel query or not. And then you can see some parallel aware uh, executor plan nodes. They're doing something special. Um, and that special thing that they're doing is usually some kind of scattering or gathering of data um, across, uh, across cores, essentially. OK, so 
the most basic um, parallel aware executor plan that we have, uh, executor node that we have is a parallel sequential scan, um, which sounds like an oxymoron, right? It's parallel and it's sequential. It sounds like it doesn't make sense. Um, until you understand that its purpose is not so much to read the scan in parallel, it's to cut the work up. It's to cut up the scan so that each core gets to look at different data. And, you know, there are reasons to do things sequentially because, um, because of what, what, you know, what they call mechanical sympathy, mechanical sympathy. Reading a file in a sequential order is a good idea because on, on, on the old spinning disks, it was a good idea because of the way disks head, heads move and so on. Reading sequential data is a good idea. And it's still the same with modern systems. It's the same at every le level of the cache hierarchy. It's the same with SSDs. It's the same with memory. It's a good idea to scan things sequentially if you can. Um, doing that, and the, but, but splitting the work up. So each core reads a page and then advances the next pointer. And then the next core, whenever it needs a new page of data, it reads a page. And then that way we cut the work up. And then everybody finishes working when there are no more pages. When, the, when that arrow hits the end, then, then you're done. It's a very simple way to chop work up. And, and that's the equivalent of those uh, ballot boxes when the scrutineers were going and grabbing boxes. Here we've got um, all these CPU calls working together to advance this next pointer and just grabbing pages to chew on. Uh, so that's where we create parallelism. It kind of comes from somewhere by chopping the data up. That's the scattering of data. And to, to the operating system, that looks a bit, bit funky because we have different processes in Postgres. Um, that means that this process is reading a block, and then this process is reading that block, and then this process is, uh, process is reading this block, and so on. So it doesn't look exactly sequential anymore, which is bad because operating systems have uh, read-ahead heuristics where they detect sequential reads, and it causes them to start issuing big reads to the disk, and then everything gets better. But luckily, um, uh, at least on Linux, there's this read-ahead window thing where you get like 128K of leeway. If you sort of, so each process is kind of reading this block, and then this block, and then this block, and so on. But Linux kind of still detects that as sequential as long as it's within this window. So it all kind of works out OK. And hopefully, your operating system starts sucking in these gigantic reads into its, into its page cache, and then Postgres finds what it needs in, 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 in good order. So that works quite well. Um, there are some operating systems where it doesn't work so well. We need to do some work on that. Um, we have a parallel index scan, which is essentially the same thing, except that it's working on the leaf pages of an index. So you're advancing this pointer along, and they're all working together. Unfortunately, because you can't get to the next page without reading the next pointer, it's more weighty. It's got uh, much more dependency between the, between the reads. So it's not quite as good as a parallel sequential scan. Um, Parallel bitmap heap scan is similar to a parallel sequential scan, but, but first you scan an index and build this bitmap, so you only have to scan the pages that are, have actually got something in them. I won't, uh, I won't go into that. So um, let's make this more interesting and add a join to our example. So you're counting the number of votes from the voters table, but let's just say we now want to join against a voter table and only count votes from voters who are enrolled. This is completely contrived. It doesn't probably make any sense if you know anything about elections. But <laughs> um, but it's, <laughs> it work, works for the example. Uh, so there's three ways that Postgres can execute joins. Those are nested loop joins, uh, hash joins, and merge joins. Um, there are some other joins algorithms that exist, but those are the three that you'll find in pretty much every relational database. And nested loop joins are the kind, and you know these, these are words you see in explain plans, right? So without any parallelism in the picture, you'd have just this and these two. You've got it just it's almost like it's almost like a description of what a join is right i mean you're for every you for every node that you pull out of this side go and see if you can find a matching node on that side and if that's an index that's going to be an index probe and that works nicely and it turns out that you don't actually need to you don't you don't, you don't actually need to do anything special to make that work in a parallel query um, nested loop joins can work perfectly well as parallel oblivious nodes. They don't, they don't know about parallelism. You just stick parallel sequential scan on this side. Each, each worker is going to be pulling in some fraction of the, of, the, of the tuples on this side. And then each one does a probe on this side in this index and then spits out its answer. And then Gather can sort out the, sort out the merging of all the data. And all, it all just works. So that was the easiest thing for us to parallelize, the easiest kind of join. But nested loop joins um, with an index on one side aren't the only kind of join that people want to do. But looking at the timeline that that gives you, this is like a, a really simple stylized version of how long that query takes. If it took that long before to, to scan through the, 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 the left-hand relation and probe the right-hand relation for every tuple and see if there's a match to execute the join, um, if you've got three cores on the job, it'll take 
about a third as long. Uh, I put my perfectly spherical cow in a vacuum over there because it's not going to be exactly a third as long, but you know that's the model, right? Um, that's conceptually it should be something like that, and that works nicely. So if you're, yeah, that's a good case. Um, and note that indexes are already shared really efficiently between back end, between by that I mean, but between processes because they're in the traditional shared memory area of Postgres where the buffer pool is and everything works nicely. Um, so you can see that it's just the same as the counting example. We've got scattering happening at one at, at the bottom of the query uh, plan and, and gathering happening at the top. Moving on to hash joins, those are much more complicated beasts. That's when you don't have an index um, on the right-hand side and you work out that it would be a good idea to load all the data into a hash table on the right-hand side. And then you can scan through all the data on the, on the, on the left-hand relation and for each tuple that you pull out of there, go and look in this hash table you've built and see if you can find a match. It, it still sounds like an, almost like an, an English description of what a join is in a way. It's, you know, um, and so this is a, a, a parallel oblivious join again. I've shown it in blue in, my, in my, the way I've done my slides here. The, the parallel ones, the parallel aware ones are doing something different than they normally would in traditional Postgres. They've got the word parallel and I've shown them in green. This guy is splitting up the work of reading that scanning that relation between all the different CPU cores. But the hash join itself doesn't know anything about that. But there's one problem with this, which is on the right here, you can see that each CPU core had to build its own copy of the hash table. That kind of sucks if the hash table is big. If the hash table is small, it's really good. Um, so hash joins consist of two phases, building that hash table, which takes about, well, well if the two relations are about the same size, then you, in a stylized drawing, you might say that it, takes, it might take the same time. To build, that ha to build that hash table and then to probe that hash table if the two relations are the same size. We only, we only got to parallelize the probe phase because each backend had to do its own copy of building the hash table with this kind of parallel oblivious hash join. In Postgres 11 that came out today, we got um, proper parallel uh, hash joins. Um, but first of all, let, let me show you why that's actually something you'd even want. Like if you were trying to make it so that you, you know, you're scanning two relations here. This one's been, been parallelized using a parallel sequential scan. If you, if you stuck a parallel sequential scan on that side, the results wouldn't make any sense because you'd be picking random things on this side and random things on that side and they, you'd be trying to join them, but the answer would be nonsense. You wouldn't be, you know, it's like you've got the list of voters and we take random pages of the list of voters and we try and join them against random pages from the phone book that we've ripped out. You won't get the answer that you're looking for. You know, it doesn't really make any sense. So we needed something else and in Postgres 11 we uh, implemented uh, parallel hash joins which have which use shared memory for for a shared hash join so they finally they're able to divide the two the two phases get divided over the three workers uh, so that's a major feature that we're releasing in Postgres 11 um, and finally um, I'm going to skip that it was about some alternative approaches to hash joins that's a um, pretty bit boring um, merge joins are the same you can have on the left hand side you you, you can scatter the data. But then <coughs> merge joins are like when you zip together two things in, 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 in order as a way of finding the matching keys. Um, that doesn't work so well uh, at the moment in Postgres uh, when a sort needs to be done on, on the uh, what we call the inner side, the right-hand side. Because similar to the hash join problem I talked about before, you would finish up with each core building, uh, doing its own sort, which is kind of stupid. And so that's something we need to work on in future. Um, Another source of parallelism, so far I've been talking about parallelism that comes from chopping, the, chopping tables up into pages um, where each CPU core gets to look at a completely arbitrary subset of the data. But there's another way to chop things up, which is partition things so that each CPU core knows exactly which subset of the data it's working on. And so here I was showing if you'd actually partitioned the uh, votes by, this is a US example, by states, and you had voters by state, and uh, you know, you've got the New York, New York votes and New York voters, and you've got California votes and California voters, you can process those things separately. This is a feature that's experimental in Postgres 11 and it's turned off by default, but if you have a partitioning scheme where the two sides of a join have exactly the same partitioning scheme, the planner is capable of coming up with a plan like that and it extracts parallelism from that, um, appending the results in parallel. Okay, so moving along to, uh, up to the next level, to the planner, um, 
I just want to say in general, the way that Postgres works uh, is a traditional cost-based planner where the first thing it does is thinks of all the ways it could possibly execute your query plan um, and estimate the runtime cost of each of those um, using simple models, which is why I showed my spherical cow again, um, and then it simply picks the cheapest plan. So um, we continue to do that for, for parallel query plans. We introduce the concept of partial plans and we consider the the parallel query plan we could come up with and see if it looks like it's going to be cheaper. Um, one thing that we're not that great at right now is choosing how many CPU cores to actually use for your query. And right now we have, uh, frankly, quite a silly way of doing it. We just look at the size of the relations. So if you're scanning a gigantic relation, uh, it's like log three of, th like there's, a, there's, a, there's a setting, minimum parallel table scan size, defaults to eight megabytes, if your tables, eight megabytes in size, then we'll think about, we'll consider a plan with one worker, one extra worker. And, if, and each time it gets three times bigger than that, we'll consider an extra worker. It's kind of like a log scale. That's not a great system. We don't have a better idea right now. I mean, we have arguments about it, but we haven't quite got to the point of figuring out how many CPU cores to use. And actually, it's, a, a, it's quite a difficult problem. Um, so the thing to be aware of is that um, you have this knob here, minimum parallel table scan size, and that affects, in this logarithmic way, the number of um, workers that get used for your queries when that table appears in a query. You can also just set parallel workers on a table, which seems like a funny place to say the number of workers, like on the table, but um, that's, the, that's the way that um, we've come up with for now. Um, and the number of workers that gets used is capped by the setting max parallel workers per gather, which defaults to two. So when you start using Postgres 11 or, or 10, in fact, uh, you'll, you'll um, start seeing queries that use up to, up to two workers, so three CPU cores for, for your query. But you can easily turn that up. Um, and you pretty much have to experiment to figure out whether your queries could benefit from more parallelism than that or not. Because you're going to run into factors like how fast your disks actually are and other things you know, that prevent uh, things from getting faster. It's not necessarily your CPUs that are the problem. Um, there's a couple of other settings you can tweak to control whether parallelism is used. There's this parallel setup cost, which we set to this lovely round number of 1,000, <laughs> which represents just the cost of forking processes and setting them up and doing some sort of initial communication with those processes. And um, that is actually the mechanism that stops simple queries, small queries that access just one or two rows from ever using parallelism. And th that's pretty reasonable. Finding what the right value is for that will probably take us some more experience. Um, but it's, it can't be too far from the truth. It's, it's, it's a reasonable setting, I think. The other thing that is expensive in parallel queries is shuffling the tuples back to the leader process. So if you've got a query plan that involves counting something and it can push the counting down to the workers and then just send the totals back, that's, that's nicely parallelizable because there's very little communication between, between CPU cores. But if it has to send all the tuples back, that's actually kind of expensive. And we model that with a per CPU uh, sort of shuffling cost. Uh, so those are two knobs you can adjust, tweak whether your queries get used. And you basically just have to play with this stuff and, and get a feel for how it works with your workload. Um, and another setting is the memory usage. Um, at the moment, uh, workmem is the traditional Postgres setting for how much memory each executor node is allowed to use, which is kind of weird, right? Because like, that means that if you set it to four megabytes, which is the default, and then the query plan happens to use loads and loads of different nodes for whatever reason, it's got a slightly perverse incentive to use more CPU nodes, in a, uh, sorry, executor nodes in a way. And, and it's the same with workers. Each worker is allowed to use its own work mem allowance, which is possibly not the best system we could have come up with. In fact, it's terrible, and we should probably improve that. Um, but it's something to be aware of is that if you start doing massive amounts of parallelism by cranking up the numbers of number of um, workers that uh, you ask it to use, each one will be able to use work mem. So that's something to look out for. You could easily trash your system. Um, uh, and many other relational databases that are like 20 years ahead of us on this stuff are doing whole system memory limits, and that's something we need to get on in future versions. Um, so there's a bunch of things that stop parallelism, parallelism from working. Using with, the, you know, common table expressions, like with something as like blah, blah, um, that actually stops parallelism, which really sucks, and we need to fix that. Um, then there's a bunch of other specific things you can do that prevent parallelism. And one of the most annoying ones, this took me like, I got, I, there was this, um, uh, 
um, mailing list uh, bug report where somebody said, every time I run this query, it doesn't use parallelism. I don't understand why. But then um, when, my, when my, my colleague does it, it works every time. And eventually I found out that some uh, GUIs like DB Visualizer, I think it was in this particular case, were like sending packet, like, you know, this is like, this is like a maximum, they were like secretly adding limits to, like secretly modifying queries in, in a way that was preventing parallelism. And, you know, sometimes, sometimes it can be a bit mystifying why you're not getting parallelism when you expect it. Um, but <coughs> anyway, I tried to put some, some things on this list here that show some, some of the main things that will prevent parallelism. Um, probably the big one is write queries. It's read-only stuff for now. It's probably going to take us a while to get to the point where we can write in parallel. Um, so there's a whole bunch of different stuff that we are going to keep working on, and um, CTEs, getting those working, parallel sorting, um, better control of memory usage, um, and writing is like when we get there, we've really arrived, I think. Um, that's probably some years off. Um, that's pretty much all I have. Um, I've, written, I've put a list here of, um, I'll put these slides up on, um, I think uh, Grant has a place to put them, is that right? Um, so there's a bunch of blogs. If you want to know more about technical guts of how this stuff works, there's a bunch of blog articles written by the various developers of some of these features and their thoughts and development and benchmarks and fun stuff like that. Um, yeah, so that's, that's me done. Does anyone have any questions or complaints? So should I repeat the questions for the? So the question was uh, locking uh, and transaction management in parallelism. How do those things interact? Yeah. Is that, so first of all, the problem is vastly simpler than it could be because we only support read-only queries in parallel, right? So <laughs> that kind of makes most of the problem go away. But there were still significant problems to solve um, to make it work. There's a kind of group locking concept. Um, I think, um, how do I answer that question? I, so the, even though it's, just kind of a, it's kind of an implementation detail that we have separate back-end processes that help your leader process work, but they're kind of conceptually working in the same transaction, right? They're, they're, it's the same transaction. So they're not, so we have this concept that they're part of the same group that's allowed to own locks together. Um, and actually, it gets kind of tricky internally because there are some things where they've got to exclude each other and some things where they've got to be considered the same, and that led to some complications in the coding, but um, from an outside view, it's the same transaction and it's the same session. So um, I'm quite certain that will be very compli a complicated problem to deal with when we get to writing, though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good question. Anyone else? Yeah. So the question is, so the way I sh as I showed on the slide earlier, the different backends are all asking the OS for different pages, leapfrogging over each other. And the question was, has it been considered to um, have backends, processes that are just dedicated to doing the sequential reading and feeding it out to, to, to the worker cores? Yes, that's a good idea. Um, in fact, Generally, the way the general philosophy of Postgres traditionally has been, compared to other databases, we let the operating system do a lot of stuff for us. We don't try to have, we, we don't try to do CPU scheduling, we don't try to do we don't try to do I/O scheduling very much. Um, we don't we just use processes and files in a very simple way. And historically, that's be, that's been because the project was worked on by a very small number of people who didn't have like I don't know I mean. I, in a conversation about this exact topic in a pub once, someone told me, well, you know, Oracle probably has a whole building dedicated just to uh, dealing with um, uh, I.O. scheduling. And 
they'll have different divisions dealing with the different operating systems and all the quirks and how you make that all work. And our view traditionally has been, well, we can't. But I think we're getting to the point where we're just going to do that. We are probably going to eventually get, we're going to stop using buffered IO at some point, by which I mean operating system page cache. Because, I mean, frankly, 10, we, 10 years ago, there used to be lots of operating systems, and there aren't anymore. Um, and so now you kind of, well, I personally am interested in a somewhat niche operating system. I, I, I don't like the monoculture of Linux, to be honest, but that's where we are, right? I mean, there's not that many operating systems you have to consider anymore. And so I think we'll eventually figure out how to write our own. Those arguments don't really make sense anymore. I think we'll eventually do our own prefetching of data and do our own I.O. scheduling. And um, yes, we'll have something like what you said. Uh, I don't know when it will be, though. It could be years. <laughs> So, yeah, yeah. well, I think operating system people and database system people have always been fighting because, I mean, have you ever seen that there was on Linux, uh, on, on, on the, on whichever man page described um, direct I.O., Linus Torvalds wrote um, that this system was designed by deranged monkeys or something. He was talking about Oracle. Like, people are, like have been, because, they both think that they should be totally in control of I.O. scheduling and buffering. And it makes no sense to someone looking at something like Postgres and say, well, yeah, we've got this buffer pool. The operating system's got this buffer pool, so now your data's double buffered and it has these weird effects that you can see. And you know, it's all, and, you know, we're worrying about whether our sequential, sequential scans still look enough like sequential scans to benefit from the heuristics. The, in the end, all of the databases over the past 10, maybe longer years, since all the main operating systems have now got really good direct I.O. that works. They didn't always have that. It's kind of new. Um, all like Oracle, DB2, SQL Server, they, these guys, they all use direct I.O. They do their own buffering. Um, and some of them do their own CPU scheduling as well. They don't just have processes for each session. They have tasklets or whatever they call them and some kind of scheduling thing and coroutines and all that kind of good stuff. And eventually, I think it's probably where we'll, we'll, we'll go as well. It's, Difficult though. Yeah. Thomas, so uh, planning, planning execution only, uh, that's where we get kind of this benefits. But it's only as good as actual statistics. Is the way that Postgres is getting statistics on tables changing the code of the problems? Hmm. So, have we, so the question is, have we had to make any changes to the way we do statistics to support parallelism? I'm not aware of any way that we have. I mean, fundamentally, we're doing things like estimating numbers of rows and estimating numbers of distinct values and these kinds of things, and those things are all still used in the same way. Yeah, but that's true with or without parallelism. I d I'm not sure there's an immediate. I'm, I could be missing something, but yeah. Oh, the pizza's is, is here. Is the statistics gathering faster under parallelism? Ah. No, it isn't. <laughs> Good idea, though. Looks like the pizza's here, so you don't have to listen to me anymore. <laughs> Very good. Okay, that's me. Thank you very much.